Hello, my front end friends. Sometimes I share some CSS solutions that get people upset at me. Basically, it happens when I show a new way of doing something and people say something along the lines of, why are you doing something that's less readable to solve a problem that we already have a solution to? So today I'm gonna look at some better solutions to common patterns that we have, uh, or just sort of why I like sometimes something that people consider less readable. And we're gonna look at three different things along the way, uh, including one that people really don't like <laughs> and got really mad at me for. Uh, and I'm going to explain why I personally think the ones that are less readable are potentially better solutions uh, than the original alternatives that we had. And I, I have a feeling I might have a little rant in me as, as we go through some of these <laughs> as well. So, so let's jump into the code and we'll see what I'm talking about here. Uh, and the first one here is actually the first thing that people got kind of upset at me for which was when I talked about how we can do this new type of wrapper, which is, you know, doing, or it's not even a new type of wrapper, but it's just, you know, we have the wrapper, the traditional way, which is when you do a max width on something, margin inline auto, which, you know, maybe the margin zero auto is even the more traditional way of doing it. Uh, and then we have padding on the sides and that's this one at the top here and it sets a max width. So if the screen gets too big, um, I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit here, just. <laughs> Right, so like it's holding my content, and when we hit a certain point, it stops growing. Uh, and the padding on the sides is there, so we have that space, and it never touches the edge of the page because that would be terrible. Cool, it works, it's fantastic, it's a very common pattern, uh, often you know, called containers. I've stopped calling them containers just because we have container queries now, and you might want a container utility class or something to say this is a container for a container query. Um, so I've gone to calling them wrappers, which is another name that still people are familiar with. Uh, and what I what I proposed is doing it this way instead, which is kind of weird, right? It looks very different. And so why would I choose this over this one? When people are familiar with this, it's one extra line of code uh, and it does the same thing. In this version of it, we're saying that we're choosing a width that's either 1160, which is what our max width was set here, or 100% minus four rem. And this is, you know, the four rem is kind of funky. I, I won't agree um, just cause here I have my padding of two and I'll explain it in a second. Uh, but I actually think that this is a better solution. And that's one of the reasons I'd want to actually use this version over this version. And the reason for that is let's come and I created these little visualizations that we can do on this uh, along the way. So I've just added background colors to them because I want to compare the difference between the two. And especially if we're at these smaller screen sizes, they effectively look like they're doing the same thing, right? If I have these visualizations off, they're identical. They're keeping the, the space of two rem on the two sides with sort of that fake padding or the padding on one and the fake padding setting I have on the other one. Um, and we can see here when I put the visualization on, this one actually has the padding because you can see it's there, whereas this one doesn't, it's, it's empty space on the sides because it's being set with a max width sort of on it. But where things are different, especially, and where you start noticing difference is when we hit that max width. And notice how the one on the bottom is actually wider than the one on the top. And that's because basically every project you're ever going to do is going to have this on it, right? Uh, this is the staple, it's on everything these days. Uh, it's very rare that you don't. And because we're using box sizing border box on basically every project we're ever going to do, that also means <laughs> that when we're doing that, that my max width that you probably got from a Figma file or something else along the way, you're matching the design that you had, you're taking the width from there, but then you're actually getting a little bit narrower than it originally was because you're adding padding to the left and the right side of it. And so it's not like this huge difference. It's not gonna be this big game breaker, but it does mean now I have to think and yeah, okay, I could do a calc and I could add that into the width or whatever I need to do to make it match. There's ways of doing it for sure. But on this version, I can just put the value in that I need and it's going to work. And I know that it's this is like exactly what I need it to be. So that's for me a little bit of a win in this one. Where things are a win here is this, everybody knows what it is, so it's easier to understand. But to me, the difference between this and this is a little bit like when arrow functions came out in JavaScript arrow functions were weird. They looked really, really different. Uh, and they're a little bit different and they have their own little things, but like, did people not use arrow functions just because they weren't familiar with them? If you weren't familiar with what an arrow function was and you came across that in a code base, you'd have no idea what's going on. If you were just used to doing functions in a more traditional way, 
what the hell is that, right? So the same thing here. This is a different way of achieving something that's similar to this. And the only reason it looks weird and it's unreadable is because you've never seen it before. That's all, that's like really the only difference that's coming in. And I personally probably wouldn't even write it like this in the code base. I have this used in a lot of the code that I do. And whenever I do it, I have a content max width, right? 1160. And then I come here and I do var content max width. <laughs> and so like, I don't need to know what's really going on. And then as far as like this number here, you can just come in here and you can set that up as a variable too. And, and this is a variable that I always have trouble with because I've always called, I, I, I've often called it padding uh, inline or something like that. Uh, and I'll do two rem and then um, I'll come and set that up here, but it's not really padding. And this is where one of the things when I shared this, people were like, it's not the same thing because it's not padding. It's your max width is 100% minus four. So there's no padding on it. Like we can see there, there's no padding on this one, which is the good thing about it. I don't want padding on there if I don't need to have padding on there. I think that's another win for this pattern. Uh, so maybe, you know, I've, I've come up with different names for this, but for today, I'm going to leave it there. If you have a better name suggested in the comments down below. Um, but then all I have to do is come here and do and uh, my var padding inline. Uh, and then I have to do a divide by two. And because uh, order of operations should keep it proper, but I'm going to do it like that where it's just to be explicit. And like 100% now, I've just went and created this really like sort of complicated line of CSS that when you first come across it, you go, I don't really get it. But is it really a complicated line of CSS? <laughs> because if I wanted to use this new wrapper and I came across this, first of all, it's gonna be documented somewhere probably in the code base going like, you know, this is to hold my content, whatever. You know, have hopefully have a good thing. I'm gonna see this and I'm gonna know what it does and I'm gonna know how I can change it. So like from a readability perspective, maybe it's a little bit more complicated if I want to get into this code and start reading it and understanding what's happening there. But from a maintenance perspective, is it harder? I don't think so. <laughs> I think in a sense, maybe it's easier because I'm saying exactly what I want these two things to be. I don't have to worry about someone understanding like, you know, again, this is pretty straightforward, I guess as well. But this is setting my max width. This is setting my inline. Who cares what's going on here? People are gonna say, oh, it's harder to maintain because it's less readable. No, it isn't. Because you're not gonna come in here and you're not gonna change what this is doing. This is just doing this one job, it's doing it really well. And the only things that matter are these two lines right here. The rest of it could be absolutely anything. You could have a hundred lines, as long as this is what the person cares about when they use it. And if they need to make a change to it, then that's fine and it's perfectly maintainable. And just because it looks different doesn't mean that it's bad, right? It's an unfamiliar, unfamiliar doesn't mean bad. And another example, here we're going to get into uh, on this front is this sidebar switcher thing that I'm going to look at here. And let's go. So just really fast, I've set this up. So and I've, I've put some sizing down here at the bottom. And I'm gonna get my face out of the way for this one. So we can see everything that's going on. So here I've set it up, I have my main with sidebar, and I've set up a breakpoint. So if I come and I, I shrink this down, this parent width, when it hits that 750 pixels, we're gonna hit, uh, I should not highlight that one, maybe I'll highlight these two. Um, but yeah, when this one here hits 750, roughly, you can see that it breaks and it goes like that. How I've done this, there's no media queries involved, there's nothing else involved. This idea comes from um, every layout by Hayden Pickering and Andy Bell, I'll link to it down below. And it's kind of hacky way of using Flexbox. It looks super weird, right? Um, what I'm doing here is not something you'd normally come across and this is hard to understand, 100% but it works. <laughs> and so what's the problem with it? Because if I wanna use this in a website, I'm gonna have a main with sidebar. The main area is going to be on the left. The sidebar is on the right. You could always have a modifier class or something that would allow you to switch them or whatever you want um, and, and how you'd set that up. But the main thing is it, it works and all I care about is this breakpoint. It doesn't matter how much complicated stuff is going on somewhere else. Because if I need to maintain this, I want to change potentially my breakpoint or potentially my gap. And there's probably nothing else that would ever have to get changed here. If you needed something that's all of a sudden three columns, you're making a new component anyway. You're not coming in and modifying the main plus sidebar. You're doing something different. So how this is working, if it's working well, then who cares? And you might be saying, well, Kevin, th this you could do with container queries now, which 100% you could. And you could probably argue, here it is, that this is more readable. I do a display of flex, and then I have when my width on the container is more than 750, 
uh, I'm going to break and change the flex direction. And in this case, I have set my wrapper up to be my container type inline size. So that's going to be the thing. And once again, if you look at the parent width on this one, when it hits that 750, we're going to get to the point right around there when it's gonna break. So it works exactly the same way. So first of all, my other one has perfect browser support. As long as Flexbox is supported, that other one will work, whereas this is container queries. Uh, though container queries are now at over 90% support. So maybe you have a good argument for going this way and people will come across this and it's maybe a little bit easier to understand. What I actually think is this one's more maintainable because I have one class and everything is controlled here. We can't use uh, custom properties inside of these types of things. So like if ever I had, I might want to use this somewhere else where I actually need to change this value. I don't have to come in with a new container query. I can just update, you know, main with sidebar narrow or wide or in a different thing or whatever it is, or I use JavaScript or an inline style and I could just change my breakpoint. So I actually think this is more usable, even if it's harder to go into the code and read it. I think it's more usable and more maintainable uh, than this one is just because of this separation and just basically, uh, you know, having to have this. But there's also this other advantage to it, which is when I come over to here, uh, this is a second version of it where what I've done is instead of the breakpoint being based on the parents width, the breakpoint is now based on the main's minimum size. So it's completely based on this. So if you look here, the main min width or the main width on that one, so that is going to break when that one hits 750. So it's happening right there. It's not happening based on the parent size. It's 100% based on the container inside, which is something you cannot do with container queries. Uh, and it's a little bit complicated on how we do it. The math is kind of weird and we're using this flex box thing. We're pushing it to the limits a little bit, but that's fine. <laughs> Cause again, I'm not gonna have to come in here and make any changes to this. The only things I care about are these three values. And the gap is important in this one, just cause it comes into the math on when things are happening. It, would, it wouldn't change much if you just had a set gap, but I sort of, I use the gap value in here to make sure we're closer to the, the actual point of this being the right size. And so it is kind of weird to do it and it takes a little bit of thinking to set it up. But this version to me is the most useful one because, or it depends, I guess. You might want something that's really depending on the container size and when that's happening. But this is really cool that I can be focused on when this is going, because that's sort of usually what you want in a layout anyway. I want the layout to this part when it's getting too narrow and 750 is actually kind of big in this case, but like at one point it's getting too narrow. And when it's that thing is too narrow, that's when I want it to change. And that's when I want it to actually shift. And the browser can figure that out for me based on a little bit of complex CSS. It's fine if it's a little bit harder to read because I honestly think it's super easy to maintain. It's gonna be documented what this is doing, how your HTML should be set up to use it, and then it's just gonna work every time and you just change a couple of different inputs and you have full control over what you want to do. And actually as a little bit of a bonus, it's not gonna be a huge thing, but we're actually getting a new thing in CSS. The only browser that doesn't currently support it is actually uh, Chrome, uh, so, which I'm in right now, but we will eventually be able to stop doing things like this times 9999. The 100% minus these means it's either a positive number or at one point it will switch to being a negative number. And the whole idea is it's either a really big number because if we get this as a positive value times this 9999, it's a huge number uh, or it switches over and it becomes a negative number at one point. And as soon as it hits a negative number, it sort of breaks how things work. And that's really what's driving this to work. I'm not gonna deep dive it now. I've talked about it in a, a previous video. And again, I'll link to the um, every layout that describes it really well. But yeah, we're, we're eventually gonna be able to drop this because there is a new uh, math function called sign that's coming, which basically whatever the calculation comes, it's either gonna return a negative one or a positive one. Um, which will help us out with these, but browser support, as I said, isn't perfect for it yet, but something to look forward to. Um, I have one more that, I, as I said, that I wanna get into, which is one that I've talked about a lot um, and shown, and again, I get some complaints about it, um, but I just wanna ask you and ask you to leave a comment down below if you have any patterns that you'd love or that you use that you think are really good that other people either get upset with for reasons you think they shouldn't or that just people don't appreciate enough or patterns that you think are really cool. I want you to share them down below because uh, I love stuff like this. Um, and I also, you know, if you, you I, I'm sure the people who disagree with me so far have already let me know. Uh, so make sure if you do agree with me to also let me know in the comments below. So it's not just this one-sided wall of anger uh, directed at me saying I'm wrong. <laughs> um, 
But yeah. Uh, okay, so there's that one. The next one, we can stay on this page. I'm just going to comment out um, the the this thing at the bottom because we don't need this uh, for this example. Uh, but I'm going to keep these color highlighters on here because it's sort of going to illustrate. Um, it's not 100% the perfect example for this. But what I want to look at is the flow class, which is something that looks like this. Uh, with And this is called the lobotomized owl. Uh, and this is something that people also don't like because they say it's not readable. And the, I, I think it was Hayden Pickering actually who introduced this. So um, Hayden's having a bit of an influence on this video. And what Flow is doing is we're adding a margin top to everything in this case of one RAM. And we're gonna look at ways we can improve on this. But the reason people don't like it again is because you come across this and it's unreadable because what the heck is that doing? Once again, it's not unreadable. It's that you're not familiar with it or it's, un it's unfamiliar. So you don't know exactly what it's doing. Um, which is fine. And there's, you know, people will say, well, there's other ways of accomplishing this. And the reason we'd even want this is because it's very common to do this, right? Margin of zero, um, just to nuke all the margins. And then we need to bring spacing back in. And one way we can do that is with margins, other people say, well, why don't you just do uh, a gap, um, you know, use grid and use a gap or use flex and use a gap. And we'll address that in a second as well. But let's say I came on my main here and then I can do my class equals flow. Uh, and then it means we're going to get our spacing that's going to come back into this area. So we've reintroduced that spacing that we'd originally taken away. The advantage with it is uh, if we don't do it with the flow, let's just get rid of both of those. You'll notice that there's extra space here at the bottom and we have the extra space here at the top, which we don't want, uh, right? There's the annoying thing with stuff in or with CSS is that the default text uh, elements all have margin top and bottom on them that we don't really want to deal with. And what this is doing is it's removing, we're removing all the margins and then we're adding it back to the top of every element except for the first element in something that has it. And what people do say is, well, instead of doing that, an alternative that we could do is to do flow and then do uh, not uh, first child, first child. And these are equivalent to one another. They do, you know, this selector and this selector are doing the exact same thing. They're selecting all of the children in here except for the first child, and then we could add our margin top. So why is this one better than that one? Because this one is definitely more readable. The problem with this, and I've used it because I went, you know what, maybe people are right. Let's do something that would be easier to understand what's going on, is this introduces some specificity issues. Uh, and that's just because, you know, the, the not doesn't count towards specificity, but this does. And I've actually ran into issues with using this because of the specificity that this comes in with, because now we have two class selectors effectively, because um, pseudo selectors like this count as class selector, or they're the same level as a class selector. Now I could nuke that. I could come in here and I could do a where uh, not first child. <laughs> And that would actually remove that specificity again. But now I just find we're, we're re-entering into the world of, you know, is this easy to understand either? Where not first child? I guess you could figure it out. It's not the end of the world. Maybe you prefer that. If you want to do that, you could. You could even, I guess, come in and just nuke the specificity from it completely by doing something like that, uh, especially because the star selector doesn't have any either. I just find like we're getting into this realm of like this works, it's fine. It's really easy to document what it's doing. So like if I come across this, yeah, this looks really weird, but hopefully I'm not just randomly finding this somewhere. I'm coming across something. It's like I use my flow to reintroduce flow spacing with like a quick example of it or something. And the reason we want margin top and not margin bottom, because people always tell me to do the same thing, but with margin bottom and then do like a not last child instead. We don't want to do that. And for one very specific reason is let's come in here with an H2, uh, just, I don't know, lorem five. So we have a little bit of text in there and proper typography doesn't have equal spacing on the top and the bottom uh, of elements. You want more space here than you have here. And just to exaggerate this a little bit, let's say my H2 has a font size of, uh, I don't know, three rem, and I might need an important on that. Oh no, we don't, okay. So because we're using M here for my margin top, this is getting a three rem of spacing on the top of it, and it only has this one here is a one rem of spacing on the bottom of it, or whatever, based on my paragraph font size on the bottom of it. So it's reintroducing flow spacing, and this is what proper typography does. You have more space above headings than you do below them, because it's just this idea of proximity and design. If you talk to any designer, they're going to agree with me. 
Um, and that's the reason we don't want to use and come in here with rem instead, because rem would just get all equal spacing. It's just not the proper flow from a design perspective. And that's the same reason I wouldn't want to come in and just you know get rid of this. All right, let's do it like this and do a display of grid with a gap of one rem or something like that. Uh, this does solve that problem. There are times where I do this. I might have a card where I just need equal spacing, then this is completely fine. But if it's articles or content that has different size of headings and you need a proper flow to what's actually going in there, you need a way to sort of reintroduce that original flow that the document had, but in a little bit of a better way. And you do that through margin top instead of margin bottom. Jumping back to having it like this, it's not a complicated one to have. You can even come in here and do it once again with a flow space or flow spacer, whatever you want to call it and you can even come in with like a default value so it's just going to work every time you use it but then if you do need to have somewhere that has a different size i could come on this main and i could have a style is equal to and do flow space is uh 0.25 m or something and make my spacing uh why didn't that work oh fl flow spacer there we go make that much smaller or much bigger whatever you need um, through this, through you know, uh, modifier classes, whatever you want. And it brings that in. It's weird looking once you understand it, it doesn't really matter too much. At least that's my own opinion of it. And like, just, just one last thing here also is like, people are saying things like this might be a little bit unreadable or, you know, uh, the other things we were looking at there with the sidebars, maybe this is unreadable, but then they're going to make like an even column system using display flex. And then, you know, how often do you see where you have a, uh, row is uh, display flex and then you have to go and do like a row children and a flex one to get them all to be equal columns like this is something that's pretty much widely accepted is completely fine or maybe even it's just a dot call and they get a flex one so they're all the same size uh, why is something like this considered readable and fine when like, can someone tell me what this is doing? I understand what flex one is doing. Most people just go, well, it's making equal columns. Well, that's not obvious. If I were to come across this and I didn't know that, that's to me just as unreadable as seeing, uh, you know, how I'd set this original part up with some of this weird stuff here. Flex one, why is that making equal columns? Most people probably don't even know how flex one is actually working. They just know that it gets their goal done. So you know, readability is completely subjective to what you understand, what you know about what you're coming across. And there's the big difference between readability and maintenance and making something that you can maintain whether or not the code is complicated or not. Because especially with CSS, the thing is doing one thing, one thing only. And as long as it can do that job, you're not gonna be going in and making a whole bunch of changes to that. You're gonna be tweaking the parameters that that thing is meant to control, which is how those custom properties can come in and make things work well. And actually speaking of Flex1, I do bring it up for a reason, because if you are curious about how it works, I've actually talked about it in a previous video. It's probably a lot more weird than you actually expect. Uh, and if you're curious about that, you can find that in the video that is right here. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, Andrew, Simon, Tim, and Johnny, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.